I didn't want to go to the emergency room because I used to work in the ER and I didn't want to be one of those people that went for something that wasn't a big deal. I woke up one morning, um, no previous history of any heart problems, and felt some palpitations in my chest. Um, that increased to kind of pressure in the middle of my chest, um, radiated down my left arm, caused some numbness and tingling in my left side of my jaw. Now I'm a physician um, and knew these were classic male heart attack signs, but because I have no risk factors, I didn't think that was possible. Um, so I actually called an internal medicine doctor colleague and talked to him and he said, no, you probably need to get this checked out. Um, so to tell you how I didn't think this was my heart, um, I was going to drive myself to my regular doctor. <laughs> Thankfully I didn't. Um, a friend drove me to the hospital and en route things got significantly worse. Um, very uncomfortable kind of pain between my scapula there. Um, when I arrived to the emergency room, um, and told them my symptoms. Um, they did do the cardiac workup, but very slowly. Um, it wasn't high on their differential as I was 36, healthy, active, young, uh, no risk factors. Um, my initial EKG and lab work was normal. And so I was placed kind of in a waiting area and was hooked up to a monitor. However, the monitor did not read. Um, to anywhere but myself and saw a run of, of VTAC, which is a deadly heart rhythm, um, and notified the physician of that. Um, unfortunately, they were not able to see that, but because of that, they did call the cardiologist consult. Um, and again, reassured me that everything was probably fine. It was probably a panic attack or an ulcer um, because I had no risk factors or no family history. Um, thankfully, um, I was admitted and they did the echocardiogram, the ultrasound of my heart, and saw that the bottom chamber, so your left ventricle, which is the pumping, pumping chamber for your heart, um, was dilated and was not pumping. And so because of that, they did send me to um, cath lab. Again, thinking things were going to be normal, um, however, my LAD um, was completely blocked and there was actually an audible sigh in, in cath lab when they saw that. Um, so they placed the stent and I went to recovery um, and everybody was shocked, um, including myself, um, thinking, well, there must have been a risk factor. Um, nobody had mentioned SCAD or, or that even as being a possibility. Um, so I was sent home, um, started cardiac rehab, and then had a second episode two weeks later. Um, very similar, not quite as severe. Um, again, the doctors were not sure what was going on um, at the time, and so I went back to cath lab and had um, another dissection of the same artery, and so they put another stent over that. Um, had complications with that um, in my arm, and um, since then have had daily chest pain, um, chronic chest pain that's pretty refractory to treatment and pretty frustrating. Um, but um, I'm alive and you know I have seen God's hand in that, um, that he has a purpose for me here um, and my time isn't done and so I'm thankful for that. Um, many people are not survivors of SCAD and I, and I do realize that. Um, some of the long-term complications, I, I do suffer from PTSD um, because of the incident. Um, also, I had to step back from my practice um, for a couple years and I'm going to be stepping back in to a part-time position now. Um, but just as somebody who is a physician and as in the medical community, the fact that this happened to me and I was not even aware of it or didn't think it was possible um, just shows the lack of education and knowledge um, that do exist within the medical community for SCAD. It was two months later that I was actually diagnosed with SCAD at Mayo. Nobody could really explain why this was happening to me. I'm like, okay, this happened twice and nobody can tell me what's going on. What we've learned in medical school is cardiac risk factors are based on traditional traditional white middle-class men is what the risk they're based on. So, you know, smoking, drinking, high cholesterol, obesity, lack of exercise, horrible diet. And when they see somebody that doesn't look like that, they think, oh, it can't be the heart. It's anxiety, it's ulcers, it's, uh, you know, all the other things, unfortunately. And so putting it back into the differential is what needs to happen. People need to be aware, hey, this is a thing. If you have a young female that comes in, you know, with 
with chest pain, take it serious until you know, rule that out before you slap a different diagnosis on is what's important. We learn about horses and zebras. So you learn common stuff is common, which are your horses, and rare stuff is rare, which are your zebras. And so that's how medical education is, you're, how you're trained to, to study and to approach patients. So when you have a zebra, that's gonna be kind of way down the road of what you're looking for because it's not common. And unfortunately, SCAD is a zebra diagnosis. When nobody could give me an explanation for why I had a heart attack and why I had, at the age of 36, two cents. Um, when they said that, that's when I wanted the referral to Mayo Clinic so that they could give me a diagnosis and tell me a little bit more about what was going on. Um, because cardiac rehab, they talk a lot about reducing fat in your diet, exercising, reducing stress, which were already things that I was doing. <laughs> For me, the, the risk factor associated with SCAD was extreme emotional stress. Um, I didn't fit into any of the other categories. I wasn't postpartum, I didn't have a connective tissue disorder, um, I didn't have Marfan's or anything like that. So I was working 80 hours a week at the time um, and I've had to slow, slow my life down. Going back and talking to my cardiologist, my local cardiologist, um, they had not had any other patients with SCAD.